Hey everybody, this is Pastor Chris, and I'm getting things set up for Pastor Dan to be able to deliver the message here in just a minute. Uh, but I wanted to let you guys know that we want to connect with you. And so if you would like to connect with us, you can text us at 913-800-8056. That's 913-800-8056. And there's a couple things you can do with that number. One, you can text the word connect and you'll get a link back to give us a little bit of information about yourself so that we can stay connected. We want you to be involved in what's going on here. We believe that even in this strange time, even though we're not meeting in person, that God still wants to do great things through Caw Prairie Community Church. And we want you to be a part of that. So you can text the word connect and you'll get that back and we can, we can do this together. If you would like to continue to support the church or start supporting the church financially, you can text the word GIVE to that number and you'll get a link back that shows you how to set up online giving. And I can't tell you how thankful we would be for that. And last but not least, if you have something you would like us to pray for, or maybe you have a need in your life, you can just text it to that number. We check it regularly and we'll reach back out to you or we'll lift up that prayer request. And yeah. We'll be the church together. Thank you, and uh, here's the message. So you didn't know it at first, parents, but it turns out that uh, week-long spring break is turning out to be like a five-month um, break from you know where <laughs> because your kids are going to be with you for a long, long time before school starts next fall. So all of a sudden you're thrust into this role of being a teacher or at least a tutor, probably a hall monitor, in some cases a lunch lady, um, a custodian, a playground monitor, and hopefully not, but maybe the principal. So hopefully you won't need a principal's office, but you see what I mean. This is gonna be a hard season for most parents. It's gonna be hard. And speaking of parents, I wanna to talk to the kids, if you're there around the, around the um, screen. So kids, this is probably a hard time for you to write. All of a sudden, mom and dad sometimes used to work from home, but like now they're working from home all the time. So it thought you'd, you thought it'd be a little bit fun. You could like bother them and maybe play with them a little bit, but it's turning out that sometimes they're getting a little grumpy, aren't they? So it's gonna be hard. And grandparents, your grandkids are the apples of your eye, the light of your life, and all of a sudden, either yourself for your sake or your Children, for everybody's sake, are telling you, hey, mom and dad, stay away for a while. So all of a sudden you don't have as much grandchild time, right? There's no games of bingo or uno. There's less Legos and baking cookies or, oh, let's be honest, there's really less uh, attempts by you to get them to look up from their iPads. But either way, it's hard. And then wedding season's coming up brides and grooms, or who am I kidding, brides and mothers of the bride. You guys have been thinking about this for years. You've been planning it specifically for, for months, maybe over a year. And all of a sudden, all those dreams are like wavering in this uncertain space of can we even have the wedding? You used to have this beautiful, radiant, uh, resting bride's face, let's call it. And now, you burst into tears when somebody asks you, are you gonna do the wedding on Zoom? It's gonna be hard. You know it's gonna be hard for a lot of us. It's gonna be hard for all of us. In fact, I think hundreds of millions of people have already had their lives changed around the globe. And honestly, that's why, clearly, that's why Chris and I will be speaking to you from this lobby as long as we can, and maybe from our own houses if it gets that severe. Um, we're here instead of downstairs because of the coronavirus and its infection rate, its spread, and the care we're trying to take with one another, with our church. That's why the church is closed. The building is closed. And that's why we're trying every week to make the ministry more and more online and reach you as best as we can. So the topic today is the purpose-driven life. What on earth are we here for? Purpose number three. Two weeks ago at our last physical gathering, Pastor Chris um, taught on worship, that we were planned for God's pleasure. Last week, our first online sermon from the loft, sermon, yeah, on the mount, on the loft. So sermon from the loft, I spoke about fellowship, that we were formed for God's family. And this week, I'm going to be talking about discipleship, that we were created to become more 
like Christ. So today as I look at that, I want to remind you, maybe in other words we could say it like this. The first calling that we have from God is to trust that he loves us. The second calling that we have from God is to accept that we were made for, formed for his family. And the third calling, probably the most challenging to date, is that we were called to become more like the Savior that he sent us. We were formed, we were called to, he, to, blah, 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 to trust that he loves us, to love the families he gave us, and to grow more like the Savior he sent us. I will just say as a footnote, I thought that we could edit that out, but we're running this live, so forget the little blah, 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 okay? So anyway, those are the building blocks that build on top of each other, or maybe even we could call them the slices of a pizza. Coming, becoming like Christ in secular terms be, really becomes, becomes, means becoming more spiritually mature. And I want to show you something. I wonder if anybody's heard of a wellness wheel. So I don't know if you can see this um, back where you are. But a wellness wheel, it's kind of a secular tool that a lot of health programs and employers use, maybe your HR department, to try to encourage you, maybe your insurance company, to try to encourage you to be healthy in all sorts of ways. And there's, there's all these different uh, pizza slices, right? Um, in this case, spirituality, health and well-being, career and money, home and family, personal growth, hobbies and creativity, life purpose and vision, relationships. Um, huh. I didn't fill any relationships. This clearly is not mine because I think my relationships are pretty darn good. But anyway, so I want you to think about this. In good times, spirituality is one of the things that we work on, right? Spirituality has always been a good thing. It's kind of like one of the things out of the whole pizza. It's one-eighth of the things we ought to be concentrating on. And the thing about wellness is that we need to have balance in all these, right? But seldom do we put a high priority on growing spiritually. You know, when things are good, there's other things that are going on, right? There's urgent things that distract us. There's um, important goals that we set to challenge us. Sometimes there's just the busy interruptions that busy us. And sometimes there's a handful of opportunities or bad things to tempt us. And nobody in a healthy time of life or in when things are normal thinks that spirituality is bad they just seldom think it's worth investing all that much time or energy in. But in bad times, it's different, right? Because in bad times, we're legitimately anxious about our health, our paychecks, if not our whole jobs, our finances, our retirement, our future. And we're worrying about how it's going to turn out. We're wondering why it's happening to us. And if we're honest, we're kind of wallowing with regret at decisions we made in the past that we wish we hadn't made now. There's all sorts of reasons why when things feel like they're getting bad, when there's bad news all around us, and we're legitimately worried that we could become part of the bad news, that we could become in danger of getting sick, we're in danger of losing our job, of closing our business, of, of, of blowing our retirement, of, well, frankly, of anything. We get scared of more and more things because there's more and more things that aren't like they used to be, that aren't normal. And it's in times like that, in the bad times, that it's we need our spiritual maturity. We need to grow as disciples even more. It's not just randomly one of the eight pizza slices. It's everything. It's almost like it's the, 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 the crust under the pizza, right? It's so important that at a time like this, we... I'd use the term we'd keep our bucket filled, right? God will sometimes fill us with this amazing peace that passes all understanding from Jesus Christ. And, and that happens suddenly and joyfully. But it doesn't stay full. Our, our spirituality bucket doesn't stay full. Our peace pail doesn't stay full. It leaks. And we've got to find ways to keep it from leaking. And that's where discipleship, I believe, comes in. And that's why today... Um, I want to just focus on one, well, maybe one and a half Bible passages, stories, that I think describe interestingly what it's like to grow as a disciple, to grow more mature in our spirituality, even when things are so stressful, uncertain, when we're afraid, when we feel abandoned, when we feel locked away. There's this awesome story that Jesus tells. Now, there's healings of, of, that Jesus does all through Scripture. But in Luke 17, I'm just going to stand up a sec here. I'm 
trying to stay seated at the table, you know, but here we go. So Luke 17, verse 11 through 14. As Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. As he entered a village there, ten lepers stood at a distance, crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. He looked at them and simply said, Go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. Wow, you know, I read this and I think, Whoa! Ten guys that are disfigured, depending on what kind of leprosy it was, maybe, maybe actually gross looking, they, they stood far enough away from Jesus to be respectful, not to infect anybody, and they called out to him and he said, fine, just go show yourselves to the priest, get a clean bill of health, and you'll be fine. And without waiting for any proof, they turned and they walked away. And scripture says, as they went, as they walked away, they were cleansed of their leprosy. They had to make a decision to trust Jesus before they could be healed. And they did. Now let's be honest, they didn't do it because they were such faithful followers of Jesus. They had never met him. They did it because they were desperate. But sometimes even desperation makes us grow in our, our desire to be obedient to Jesus, to listen for his voice, and to follow when he, says us, when he tells us to go. So I think this is a, a pretty impressive thing but it also remembers me, it remembers me, reminds me of another story in scripture of another leper in which things didn't go the same way. It's the story of Naaman. So Naaman was a Syrian general, like a five-star general under the king of the Aram province or Aram kingdom, right? And he had amazing success, was super wealthy. He was famous and feared on the battlefield. The king was very grateful to have him in his employ, but he had leprosy. And so he goes to a Jewish prophet, Elisha, who, by the way, was living in Samaria at the time. He goes to a Jewish prophet, and he says, heal me. And so he brought all sorts of stuff to give him as a gift, right? And it turns out Elisha didn't even really respect him that much. He just sent a message, and he said, all right, go dip yourself seven times in our Jewish river, the Jordan. And when the general heard that, he was furious. He's like, well, aren't the rivers in, in Damascus and Syria, aren't those like way better than this tiny Jewish river? I'm not going to go do that. And he got really angry. And his, his servants had to talk him down. By the way, this is in 2 Kings 5, if you want to open this on your own. Um, his servants tried to talk him down from the anger, and they said, Master, look, if he had asked you to do something daring and dangerous, of course you would have done it. Of course you would have done it. But all he asked you to do is a simple, little, almost trivial thing. Don't you think you ought to do that? What if that's the right thing to do? And eventually, the general calms down. He kind of lets the insult roll off his back. And he goes to the Jordan River with his servants, with his parade of the gifts he was going to pay the prophet with. And he dips himself in the river seven times. And on the seventh time that he submerged his head under water and he stood up, his skin was miraculously cleaned. And he went back, he had all the servants, they, they packed up and they went back to see the prophet at his house. And he was so overjoyed. And he had a conversation with Elisha and he blessed Elisha and Elisha blessed him back. It's a cool little story. But I love it because he had to be talked into it, right? He had to be convinced that this was a good idea. Whereas the lepers in the story of Jesus and, and centuries later in Luke 17, they didn't need to be convinced. They heard one direction from Jesus and they did it. So it's kind of cool. Well, it's kind of cool. What it does for me is it shows all sorts of perspective. There's, there's some irony in there. Remember last week I talked about how God is omniaronic. So there's this great irony that, that in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew scriptures, to, to say it better, in the Hebrew scriptures, it's the it's the outsider, the foreigner, who refuses to have faith. When the, when the poor Jewish prophet tells him what to do in the, in the New Testament, in the story here, the Jewish prophet, Jesus, tells the, tells, the disciple, tell, tells the lepers to have faith, and they do. And what we're about to hear is that not only do they all have faith, and they all turn and go to the priests in the synagogues, but they had so much faith 
that one of, the, one of them had so much more than faith, he had gratitude, and he turns around and he comes to Jesus. And I want to read this. So this is from Luke chapter 17, verse 15. I like to stand up when I read the gospel. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus, and he shouted, Praise God. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. And this man was a Samaritan. Jesus said, Didn't I heal ten men? Where are the other nine? No one has, has no one returned to give glory to God except this one foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, Stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. Now, if you know the Greek or you want to look it up, the word for healed also means saved, right? It's, it's the same, the, the healer is a savior. It's from the same Greek word. Your faith has saved you. So they all got healed. They all got the privilege of going back into community. They all are taking the risk of embarrassing themselves or embarrassing themselves in front of the, from the rabbi, the synagogue, and their family by showing up. What if the leprosy hadn't gone away? They all took that risk, but only one of them was so mature that he not only had faith, but he had gratitude as well. And the, the impact that Jesus was, the impact on Jesus was profound. Right? He healed people all the time with a look, with a touch. Only the most interesting ones, I think, are recorded in Scripture. He healed far more and so did his disciples. But for some reason this made Scripture and it made it because the man was a foreigner who said thank you. And I think this, I think this really has to do or, or leads us to, to consider what was about, what about this made it so um, impressive and so worth remembering. But before I, before I kind of go to the lessons, I want to just say one more thing about leprosy itself. Well, if you look up at any Bible dictionary or Wikipedia or something, this biblical leprosy that gets referred to was either one disease but, or a, a, a family of skin diseases. It could, it could include psoriasis. It could include all these different things, eczema. But it also included the severe form that we know as um, leprosy. And so um, what I want to share is that, that uh, this disease was, let me get this, let me formulate this right. This disease was known across the ancient world and it's known today still in this world. One of the interesting things about it uh, medically is that there have been cases of, of leprosy discovered in both animals and humans in, in several continents, at least West Africa, between chimpanzees, um, monkeys, and humans. They all share the same bacteria that causes this um, mycobacterium leprae. And here in the southwest of the United States, it's found in both Americans and in armadillos. So there's this similarity to COVID-19, right? Which is also, um, what's it called, zoonotic. But when it, when it or originates in an animal, but it's passed to humans. And uh, so the, it just rings extra, extra true, extra relevant to me right now. So as I say that, I want to I summarize some, some lessons here. I call them the leper lessons from Luke 17. So number one is that people who experience pain and suffering and mockery, they tend to learn maturity faster than people who don't. Right? They learn to trust Jesus, like the lepers did. They learn to trust the Word of God, like Naaman the Syrian did. They trust Jesus and they want to listen to Jesus. And as the foreigner, as the, as the Samaritan showed, they're more grateful to Jesus. So maturity. Maturity in Jesus Christ, that's what patches the water pail. That when God fills us with this peace that happens from time to time, we won't lose that peace, even if we don't hear God's voice, even if we don't get clear direction, even if the future seems so uncertain. We won't lose it because God has taught us how to patch our own pail. Patch our pail with maturity, with gratitude. There's other couple lessons too. One is that, okay, one, people who experience pain, suffering, and mockery tend to learn maturity faster than those who don't. But I also see in this that these lepers, they longed for their families. They longed for connection. They longed for a relationship outside their kind of sick enclave. But notice also that they loved their neighbors enough to stay away. They didn't rush to Jesus knowing that he was a healer and expect him to touch them. 
They stayed at a safe distance. And you know, Elisha's a prophet. Jesus was called a prophet. And so if you'll permit me, let me be a little bit of a prophet now. And that is to say, I see in this episode of Naaman a little bit of a reflection of what's happened in America lately, right? There's, there's some of us who are so hyper-confident that we have faith to get us through, that we, have, um, that we are indefeatable, undefeatable, whatever, that we're indomitable, that we're impenetrable by virus, that, that we're going to keep living life as we used to. And that's, that's prideful. That's prideful and it suggests that, that we're thinking more about how we feel, how we want to behave. And we're not thinking as much as what the experts, as the authorities, as the vulnerable would like us to behave. So I know some of these people that, that don't want to like uh, hunker down and stay isolated, a lot of these are great, wonderful Christian people. In fact, they got great hearts, they're generous, they're servant-hearted, and probably when there's real emergencies, these are the people that jump up first and say, we'll save everybody, and they do. So it's not that there's, there's a, a, a mean-spiritedness. There's just, like with Naaman the Syrian general, there's just a little cockiness. And if that's anybody that's look, listening right now, I want to challenge you. Right? The lepers stood far enough away that they wouldn't infect Jesus, and they were longing to get healed so they could go back and be in community. And I ask you to do at least the same to protect your neighbors, the vulnerable in your family, and the world that Jesus died to save. Okay, well, enough, uh, enough prophet talk. Here's what I want to say. So people long for family and connection, but those lepers loved their neighbors, and they sacrificed in order to keep them safe. And then finally, Jesus is willing to chastise us, insiders in the tribe, when we don't love the outsider, or when we don't love him, the way that the outsiders do. And I think that's fair to hear. You know, when Jesus said this, he says, didn't I heal ten men? Where are the other nine? He wasn't necessarily saying that just to the leper. He said, has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? He's clearly talking to the crowd around him, the Jewish crowd. He is scolding them. He's admonishing them for, for this not only lack of gratitude, but this take-it-for-granted spirit that the people of God sometimes have for the favor of God. Now let's be honest. Chances are very good that all of us are going to suffer in the coming weeks and months. We're going to suffer financially. We're going to suffer emotionally. We're going to suffer, many of us, physically if we get infected, whether it's severe or lightly. And some of us some of us will cause our families to suffer deeply because we might not make it through. Right? We might come to meet our Lord Jesus faster than we had planned to. And so, like the ten lepers, I'm, I'm challenging us that we can and we should. We should cry out to Jesus and trust that he's near. We should pray that he will answer us and that he will heal us with all of heaven's power. And that before his feet, we will bow down and worship regardless of the outcome, whether that worship happens here on earth or in heaven. In the meantime, things are different. Things are tough. So I want to close with an invitation to you to read a Bible passage with me and with your family or roommates if they're there, if they're in the same room. See, St. Paul wrote this passage to a mid-sized city in what's now what's now Turkey. It was called Asia Minor back then. It was a Roman province. And uh, this was the church at Colossae. It had been a much more vibrant and economically growing city a couple hundred years ago, but it had kind of fallen on more modest times now. Um, but they had a powerful sense of faith. This city really wanted to lean into Jesus and proclaim him for everything it was worth. And so, so Paul is giving them, giving them encouragement and reminding them of how they need to behave if they want to grow to the maturity of Jesus Christ that will, make, that will make Paul proud to call them disciples, that will make Jesus look good by the actions that his followers take. And so uh, I believe this will be on the screen, but I want to read it to you. This is, this is a passage that uh, Chris and I sometimes use when we do weddings. 
Because his injunction to holy living is just as important for a married couple and a family as it is for a, a church or a society. So if, if you've got family in the room, if you've got kids, spouse, roommate, I want you to lay your embarrassment down and say these words with me from the New Living Translation, Colossians 3, verses 12 through 17. Since God chose you to be the holy people that he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. And always be thankful. Let the message about Christ and its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom that he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks through him to God the Father. And all God's people said, Amen.